Here it is, episode number 715 of Let There Be Talk. Today is September 18th. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. All kinds of things to jump into today. It will be a solo episode, but I do have some insane guests coming up here in the uh, next few weeks. I I don't really want to talk about it yet, but you will love all of them. And I want to thank you for taking the ride on the solo episodes. I've been uh, having a great time doing them and kind of gives me a little uh, time to stretch out and let you hear who the fuck I am. (laughs) Anyway, welcome aboard. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, I had some good shows. I did six shows over the weekend here in Los Angeles, uh, three Friday, three Saturday. And uh, they were great, great shows actually. Uh, awesome audiences. The weather's kind of cooled off. Finally, not a thousand degrees. We still got the six dollars and twenty nine cent gas. So yeah, that's pretty fucking cool, right? <laughs> Speaking of that, thank you to the Patreoners out there. Oh my God, thanks for your support. And uh, oh, I wanted to give a shout out to. Uh, the uh, great, hold on, let me get this together, Frank, uh, Frank Bernacki. Thank you so much for your donation to the show, and uh, it means a lot to me. So Frank Bernacki and all of the Patreoners, I will be doing a Zoom tonight on the Patreon. If you are a Patreoner, Monday tonight, September 18th, around 6 p.m. Pacific time, I will be doing a live Zoom where you can hang out and shoot the shit with uh, old man Dean. Anyway, so yeah, six shows over the weekend, which were fun. And then Sunday night, which was last night, I uh, was asked to conduct the Q&A at the premiere of Mr. Jimmy. If you've listened to the last few episodes, I had Peter Dowd on who directed this documentary called Mr. Jimmy. And uh, just a great, great story of passion. Go back and listen to the episode if you haven't heard it. Try to see this film, MrJimmyMovie.com. You can find it, but um, it's crazy. It's basically about this guy who uh, becomes obsessed with Jimmy Page and basically uh, dedicates his entire life becoming Jimmy Page. It's wild. So the premiere was at the... uh, Chinese theater, the world famous Los Angeles movie theater complex. And I went down there, hosted the Q&A. It was just great. And uh, it was it was wild. They had a red carpet, of course. Red carpet's always weird. You know, sometimes when I go to red carpets, you know, they just, they don't know who the fuck you are. Like you get called, they're like, hey, you want to come down and do the red carpet? I never really like doing that because... It, nobody knows who I am. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, maybe a, a small, small bucket of people in the world know who I am. And I'm I'm grateful for that. But, you know, it's it's uncomfortable when you're walking the red carpet and you got like a, the, you got a lady next to you holding a sign. Dean Del Rey comedian. And they they still don't know. So they got their cameras up, right? They're ready. And then you come down and they're just kind of waiting for the next person. You might have one person take a shot just in case you become famous later. They have it in their archive. Yeah, here he is at a red carpet in 2004. <laughs> um, but this was great to go to and support this and uh, see the people that are so into Zeppelin. Zeppelin is such a juggernaut still to this day. And uh, it was cool to talk to Mr. Jimmy. There's a translator there. So I was doing the uh, Q&A through the translator, which is always uh, wild because, you know, you're like, hey, man, so uh, in 75, Jimmy Page broke his fingers. And it's known as the, you know, broken finger tour. And he played pretty sloppy. So when you uh, do 75 era Jimmy Page, do you, uh, you know, play sloppy like that for 75? And then he, you know, then the translator 
tells him the question, you know, and then he comes back with a long, like five minute answer and then translators writing down all this stuff. And then she tells me what he said. So it's always weird. The audience is just sitting there like waiting. I mean, I was just like, mm-hmm, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And then the answer comes about six minutes later. But, oh, Mr. Jimmy, what a what a, uh, a cool human that guy is. Wild thing that happened while I was there that I did not expect. This is the crazy thing about L.A. or just life, really, when you're out and about in the entertainment world and you're constantly grinding. You never know who the fuck you're going to meet. It's so wild. But there I am uh, doing the red carpet. And Randy Johnson, the big unit, pitcher, uh, probably most famous for Mariners slash Arizona Cardinals, I guess I would say. I mean, we had him on the Giants his last season ever. But um, he was just a dominating pitcher in Major League Baseball coming in at like fucking six, nine or something. If you look at the photo, you know, I'm already short, but I feel like I've been shrinking over the years. And if you you look at the photo of me, big unit, Mr. Jimmy and Peter Dowd, I look like this, the shrunken man. Like I'm five, six, but next to the big unit, I look like I'm about five, three. (laughs) And when I wear sneakers, I look extra small, which I've never been insecure at all of being short. It's never fucking bothered me at all. It's actually been a blessing uh, since my life has been travel on airplanes. Thank God I'm not fucking tall because these seats on the airplanes are just awful. They get smaller and smaller. You're just kind of like, oh, I'm five, six and I'm in there going, this sucks. I couldn't imagine the big unit flying commercial. You'd have to only go first class. So all your flights are always like 5,000 to 10,000. There's no way that guy could fly coach. Anyway, he fucking flew in for the movie. And, you know, it just reminded me of that era. I used to just love baseball. I still like a little baseball. I like watching it just burned out, you know. Uh, or listening to it. I just love the Giants. I, I loved going to the games back in the day. I love Pac Bell Park, which is named some other fucking thing now. But I just love that it's kind of a great decompressor. A lot of people think baseball is boring. Those are probably the same people that think reading is boring, you know, because it's slow. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of action. But that's the good thing. You go out with a buddy, you eat some fucking shitty hot dogs. I never, ever eat hot dogs. Unless I'm at a game, I'll have a hot dog. Hot dogs are bizarre to me. It's not something I ever, like it was hot dogs and hamburgers. I would never choose a hot dog over a hamburger, especially when you're growing up poor. The hamburger was like deluxe. Like we're having some fucking cheeseburgers oh my god but you know you go to the ballpark and you just fucking forget about everything and just chill out there and watch these guys fucking throw i've sat behind the uh, home plate a lot of times and you watch these pitches come down and the movement the wackiness the whole thing about a human throwing an object and the other person has to fucking hit it with a piece of wood. That is the most prehistoric shit going on right now. Still right now in 2023, a guy throws something, the other guy's trying to hit it with a piece of fucking wood and then people got to catch it. It is so fucking crazy. Big unit threw 102 miles an hour at his peak 102 miles out. I don't know if you've ever been to the batting cages. That's another thing I used to love to do. I'd go to the batting cages and just fucking not not even train them for anything. Just fun to swing the bat. And I, I even did it up to about five years ago. I wouldn't mind going again. But after my neck surgery, I'm always afraid to do anything. 
But you go to the batting cages and you get in a 60 mile an hour batting cage and they fucking come at you like missiles. You can't believe what 60 is like. 102 miles an hour. I mean, to the training that it takes to hit that or the, or a fucking wacky knuckleball that right after 102 miles an hour comes at you like at 70 miles an hour. And you're just like, Oh fuck. And the, the knuckleballs just, it's just dancing all over the place or a curveball that looks like it's way the fuck uh, like above your head, like a ball. And then it just swings in or a sinker, all these fucking things that some fucking weird uh, guru dad taught his son in the backyard, you know, you put your knuckles on it like this, and then you let it go in this. It is wild that people have learned to throw a ball in all these weird fucking, you know, uh, this weird junk pitches, as as they were called. Man, the guy, that was the thing. We were playing baseball. This guy's got a lot of junk. Got a lot of junk, man. You get up there and you just... You just can't even fucking believe what the ball's doing. So to meet the big unit, it was fucking an honor, man. The guy's a rock, uh, rock and roll hall. He is a rock and roll hall of famer, actually. Uh, he's a, a baseball hall of famer. He's won the World Series against the Yankees. He's thrown no hitters. He grew up in Walnut Creek, California. He's a Bay Area guy. He's only 60. It's so funny, these baseball guys, when you're young watching them, you don't even realize the guy's only three years older than me. You know, at the time, like I was 18, let's say, he's like 22. You you just don't think of uh, guys. It's like when I was growing up watching comedy, I just thought the dudes were old because they had sideburns and fucking long hair and they parted it on the side. I always thought that fucking like John Belushi was like 40. (laughs) <laughs> Saturday night Live. I thought he's like, you know, 30s, 40s. But big unit, man. Those pictures back in the day, Nolan Ryan, big unit, all these dudes uh that were just fucking unreal. Raleigh fingers, just their names, their looks. Big unit had like fucking long hair. He'd come out to rock music. He's retired now. I asked him why he was at the uh, at Mr. Jimmy, uh, and he said that he went over to Japan like 20 years ago to you know play in some kind of uh, Japanese All Star game or something, and went and saw Mr. Jimmy by uh, just by chance at a club 20 years ago. Mr. Jimmy has been doing uh, Jimmy Page for 43 years. It is nuts. So, uh, big unit Randy Johnson became a giant fan and has been following his career ever since, which is wild. So, uh, catch Mr. Jimmy out there on tour right now with Jason Bonham. And uh, great to meet you, big unit. He is now a full on photographer and go to his things. It's RJ51photo, I believe, is his Instagram. And, um, he is just an incredible photographer now. And all these years, he's been uh, into rock and metal. He's been shooting concerts most of his life for fun. He's got some amazing fucking photos that are right up there with anybody's uh, photography of the legends. Jim Marshall and all those guys. This guy has got some insane great photos of like Joe Strummer. Joe Strummer, man. Um, the clash, he shot the clash in 82 on that, on that who clash tour, rock the Casbah era. Unbelievable. And, you know, and of course he's been shooting rock photos ever since. Got some amazing Cornell. He's got some amazing rush photos. And then he's got some killer photos of just humans and animals. It, it is wild, man. Living a good life, that guy, man. He made a lot of fucking money. A lot of money, man. He signed a deal for 52 fucking million with the Mariners. And on his final season with the Giants, he signed an $8 million deal for one year. Can you imagine working one year, $8 million? 
after your agent or whatever in taxes, you get like, I don't know, let's say six million just one year. 52 million plus 8 million plus a fuck another 5 million here, whatever commercials. The guy's fucking hopefully set. I'm sure he is, man. I can tell he's just out living his, uh, he's out living his best life. He's just living the best life. So it's great to meet him. And it's always, uh, while you never know who the fuck you're going to meet when you're just out and about doing, uh, doing life. Um, let's get into some stuff here. Uh, all kinds of things to talk about. You too recorded a new song, a, a video for a new song in Vegas yesterday called Atomic City. Uh, I guess it was wrote after the nickname of Vegas back in the day when they were uh, doing all that nuclear pl- uh, testing back there, new- nuclear bombs. The old Atomic City, they're uh, gearing up for their residency at the Sphere, which I, I said I will be going to with a fistful of mushrooms and reliving my Octung baby tour at the Oakland Coliseum back in the day. I cannot wait to see this, even though Larry Mullen will not be playing because of the back surgery. He did play in the video yesterday, which is great to see Larry there. He looked good, too, man. He fucking had guns. He's just back there. Larry is a a type of guy that looks like he never ages. And uh, their edge was playing some uh, strange hollow body, which is uh, unusual to see. But they were filming the video. They they shot it twice. They did a pop up concert down in Old Town, Fremont Street. Uh, same spot. They still they did still haven't found what I'm looking for right there. Many years ago, going back and reliving some U2 history. Song. Uh, Song didn't sound bad. I can't really tell because it was uh, some phone footage, but it did sound like Call Me by uh, Blondie. And I think uh, Deborah Harry might be calling Bono (laughs) with a little bit of uh, royalty kick down there, man. The chorus was very reminiscent of Call Me, but looks like we're going to have some new music from you, too. And uh, looking forward to hearing that. I'm always interested to hear what they do. Uh, Last few albums have been okay, but some of their records, a lot like I said with the Stones, have like one or two incredible songs. So uh, we always know we're going to get something good from them. I'm looking forward to seeing that Sphere concert. (laughs) I have to say that that name of that venue, weird Sphere, because it's just such a weird... uh, a weird name. I can't believe it's not like uh Metropolitan Life Insurance Sphere or uh, you know, uh Golden Graham Cereal Sphere. <laughs> but um it's going to be cool, and it's it's cool to see you two doing cool shit. Somewhere along the way, you two got a bad rap. They got like the uh they got the Tom Cruise, I would say. They got Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise making great, great films, great actor, just a killer. Uh, box office, absolute super icon. And then he jumps on a couch on Oak for Winfrey. I love this girl. And then people are like, he's a freak. What a freak. He jumped on the couch. <laughs> it was like, what? That that's what you're fucking looking down on Tom Cruise for. And uh, you two kind of got Tom Cruise when that uh, iPhone new iPhone came out and it came automatically with the U2 record. And one of the records, I can't remember now, it was years back. And then everybody was angry at you, too. And it's like, hey, man, this is a big deal. Just go press delete if you don't want it. And if you do want it, you got a free fucking record. It's already uh, impossible to make it in the music business these days. Uh, So fucking hats off to them for thinking of something outside the box. You know, oh, they fucking hijacked my phone. I don't fucking like those dicks. It's like, relax. 
I mean, I can't even tell. I was reading just a couple of days ago. Now bands can't even really afford to tour. So there's going to be no money for musicians at all. They they lost all the money from the free uh, downloading and streaming. Uh, there's no record sales anymore. And now they can't afford to tour because the gas and the crew and the flights and the tour buses and the insurance and the hotels are all a fortune. So now they can't even afford to tour. The venues are taking fucking a giant chunk of their merch, uh, you know, a cut of their merch. It's fucking, it's getting awful out there, people. And uh, I guess people just really don't care until one day they don't have anything to do. And they're like, hey, man, I don't really have anything to do. What happened to concerts? Well, you know, uh, you, you, you just didn't want to pay for the music. <laughs> <laughs> fucking man it is uh it is getting grim out there i don't know if it's getting grim uh in general like like life just seems like it's fucking way out of control like there's tons of crime and there's tons of gloom and doom and everything costs a million dollars i know that's for a fact but i don't know if it just seems way more intensified because the social media is, that's all they seem to show us. You know, once in a while, I'll get a video of like, uh, you know, uh, a cat getting saved by a, a, a man, you know, 500 feet up in the air or, a, or a, a dog making someone happy or whatever. And you just look at this video for a minute and it makes you so fucking joyful inside you're just like oh my god this is chipping away all the fucking coal on my heart look how beautiful this is this this amazing human gave this person 500 dollars in a grocery store that had no money you know i just saw this video this guy's like hey if you give me five dollars i'll give you this uh lunch box and with whatever's in it, people are like, eh, get the fuck out of here, which I get. So somebody talks to me in a grocery store. You just become so jaded because you're just like, this guy's a fucking weirdo. Something in the lunchbox. What's in there? Anthrax, fentanyl, fucking poison, a snake. You know, that's how fucking, that's how guarded we become as humans. And he handed it to this old woman and had $500 in there. And she was just crying, you know? And you're like, I need more of this in my algorithm. You know, I've got like 17,000 smash grabs and, and car robberies and, and, uh, and road rage videos. And then I'll get one of these and I'll just be like, this is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Fuck. Oh my God. I don't know. I I was asking my friend over the weekend, I go, am I the only guy paying for shit? I feel like a sucker. People are just walking in, grab stuff at the grocery store and the and the mall, not paying. Nobody does anything. I'm over there in line, waiting in line to pay. I'm like, wait, do we not have to pay? Is that if I don't have to pay, I got no problem paying my bills, you know? I got all this fucking free shit. I can eBay it. <laughs> mm. Anyway, it's a uh, it's it's a, a wild world out there, and I just try to uh, stay positive. And I think um, most of you that listen to this try to stay positive too. It's the only way you can, only thing you can do, you know, only thing you can do. Anyway. So, uh, big love out there to you, too. Looking forward to going to seeing that um, and hearing what you got coming up next here. Lots of uh, lots of stuff here to dive into still. Solo episodes. Nothing but love for you guys tuning in every week. Um, oh, I saw on Instagram, speaking of Instagram, that some company finally has the flying car. And uh, man, 
I think that's one of the things I look at the most on Instagram is cars. Guy was driving by me yesterday. I put it up on my Instagram. Uh, he had a like one of those 1972-ish Ford Mach uh, 3 or Mach, Mach 3, Mach 1 Mustangs convertible, the long cigar body ones. That's like a weird era Mustang. Not as weird as the Charlie's Angels Mustang too. That small little mom Mustang. Remember they came out with that in the 70s? Mustang 2, compact and cool. <laughs> Not even close to cool. And uh, one of the Charlie's Angels had one. But uh, the long cigar early 70s ones are starting to grow on me. It's weird how you hate cars growing up. Like you're like, oh, that one's ugly. And then as you get older, you're kind of like, man, I kind of fucking, I kind of understand the design of that. Look at that. <laughs> you know, you, you, you drop the, the, uh, the rigidness of like, I only go, uh, you know, Dodge Challenger 440 Hemi. That's all I like is Hemi. Everything else is stupid. You know, Camaro 68, RSSS, 396. That's all I go. And then as you get older and these cars are on the road, you know, that car's from like 1972. Here we are in 2023. And you see a, a cherry version of the car. Even if you see a beat up version, you're amazed that that car is still on the road. You ever see like a 80s Toyota Celica? It's not like a special car, but you see one now and you're like, fuck, that's fucking cool to see that fucking 80s Celica. I mean, how many are on the road still? And, and Toyotas are bulletproof, but you just don't see them anymore. And uh, to see just a, a car that's not your, you know, suit like a Ferrari or a vintage Porsche or a vintage Lamborghini or Mopar to see a car that wasn't that popular and to see it on the road still and cared for, you're like, God, that's all of a sudden you're just in love with it. You're like, fuck, I could drive that. And that guy was driving by me. It was a convertible and I was filming him. He could see us filming him. And I just gave him the, yeah. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> He was just out on a Sunday enjoying his fucking cigar Mustang. Purple. It was purple with white stripes. It was beautiful. Anyway, so I love cars, of course. Everybody knows that. So this here comes the flying cars finally. Some car uh, company. What's it called? Uh, Aleph or Aleph? A-L-E-F. Uh, they got a $300,000 flying car. And this is the funniest fucking part about it. You can put down a $150 deposit right now. A <laughs> $150 deposit on your $300,000 flying car. What are you fucking out of your mind? Just make the deposit like 50 grand. Because why waste people's time? You know, your company's time of like, well, we got another deposit for 150. Are you kidding me? Why do you make the deposit fully accessible like the car's like six grand? It's 300 grand. And who's the lunatic that doesn't have the money but puts down a deposit anyway, just in case I win the lottery or, uh, you know, they're cruising around work? Yeah. I uh, they're at Burger King working. I put down my deposit on the Aleph flying car. Put down one fifty, so uh, going to be a little light on rent this month. But I uh, got my deposit on the three hundred thousand dollar flying car. Oh my god! Both people are loony lunatics. The guy putting down the deposit. And the dude, the company, the dude that came up with it, like, let's just make the deposit like 150. Let's, I mean, it's all, it could almost be a scam. They get like 10,000 deposits and then they, they're not even a real company. They just shut down the website and fully pocket like 
a ton of money. I, I don't know who the fuck Aleph Automobiles are. I don't know who they are. You just fucking put down their credit card info. Here's my 150. You have no idea. You haven't seen the car. You haven't you haven't been to the brick and mortar factory. You nothing. And you just go and deposit. That's a great scam. Right? It's right up there with that Vegas. They got hit by the uh these hackers, Black Cat or something over the weekend. Did you see that? They just went on somebody's uh LinkedIn, got an employee's name, then they called MGM and they're like, hey, this is uh uh you know Jimmy Smith. Uh I forgot my 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 sign in. And they go and look, yeah, Jimmy Smith works here. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to sign in here uh at home. And then they just give the fucking info to the hackers. And then they hacked the entire fucking casino, turning off slot machines and and the power. Oh, my God, it's fucking crazy. That easy. And then they asked for a ransom of like six million or something. Oh, my God. So why not just build a uh, yeah, Del, Del Rey's, uh, Del Rey's flying motorcycle? Just put down a, a deposit of 50 bucks. I'll be uh, delivering these things in 2025, the flying motorcycle. Hit up my PayPal. <laughs> oh, fuck, man. That's not a bad scam. Just shutting it down after two months, leaving with the money. You're not even remembering your deposit because they're not due till 2025. So sometime late 2024, you realize you can't make rent and you kind of want to get your deposit back and the fucking website doesn't work anymore. God damn. But anyway, I watched the video on it. It's so funny. It's just like a, it's just a, it looks like a bad video game. And they're like a flying cars. Uh, it just takes off and it's just a two seater fully electric. It goes like 300 miles driving 110 miles flying. And uh, the car just pops up and just goes over a few cars and traffic, then just goes back down. And I was like, this this looks like a bad video game. There's no video of like a real one, like a guy going, here's the real prototype. Nothing is. And then they just showed like uh, it's in San Francisco Bay Area where the car is being made. They just show a bunch of these flying cars going over the Bay Bridge on top of it, you know, above it with like these kind of flying uh, like road cones. So you know which way to go. And there's like 80 cars flying one way, 80 flying the other. I'm like, this is, this is fucking jive. Anyway, the flying cars are finally coming. We'll see. We will fucking see everybody. Uh, and my buddy's got a great bit on that. Uh, Amir K. Go look up Amir K. Flying Car. Funny ass comedian, old friend of mine. Anyway, flying cars are coming, buddies. Interesting thing. I've, I've just been, you know, it seems like my life is just Instagram. I don't know how addicted you guys are, but it's either uh, Instagram. I don't really go on any of the other social medias ever. Uh, I, I've never been a Facebook guy. I just... There's a fan page up that I just put up uh, the podcast each week. And then uh, Twitter just became a shit show now uh, over the last five years from the politics. And uh, threads is weird. It just seems like it's it's no man's land. Threads. So I don't know. But I love Instagram. Everybody knows I love it. I'm always on it, talking about it. But there was a video that popped up. Of Mark Ford from the Black Crows, formerly of the Black Crows, a, a friend of mine, and uh, one of what uh, I consider one of the greatest guitar players of all time in my uh, lifetime of seeing um, live and concert and recorded some of the leads that he's laid down on those Black Crows records over the years, stuff like uh, My Morning Jacket. Uh, my morning jacket, my morning song, my morning jacket, great fucking band. Uh, my morning song, uh, Remedy, uh, Wiser Time, 
uh, just thematic, incredible, incredible leads over his history in the Black Crows. And then, of course, uh, getting fired, severe drug addiction, and uh, then pulling himself out of the addiction. Later on, rejoining the Black Crows to the complete joy of every Black Crow fan ever. Steve Gorman and Mark Ford back in the band. Another solid long run. Then Mark Ford out again. Maybe some, uh, who knows, maybe some drug problems, maybe some life problems, whatever it is. Over all these years, he's completely uh, been a survivor. and. I've been watching these videos lately and he has absolutely just pulled it out and out there touring a three piece band. It looks like it's three piece. Uh, maybe there's a keyboard player that I can't see, but he's just playing at, at just a fucking monstrous high level. And I'm watching this video. And he's out just doing a small club tour. He played like Novato, California last weekend. And then he's in like, you know, New Mexico, small rock clubs. And uh, like I said earlier in this show, how hard it is to tour. And, you know, there's hardcore Mark Ford fans showing up. I'm a hardcore Mark Ford fan. I've always fucking loved this guy. He played uh, with my band for a couple of shows, a live recording and shit. He's been on the podcast two times, and he has just absolutely blown my mind with his originality, his amazing tone, his unbelievable uh, love of rock. And he's, you know, he did the Neil Young uh, thing recently, where he's playing all classic Neil Young songs, and just, just a, just a fucking a crushing player. And it, it is uh, it is sad to me in this day and age that he's not in the Black Crows. And I know I don't like to I don't like to really bring that up because it's just old news and it's been you know talked about over and over. But it's amazing to think about these incredible players and the chemistry that they have amongst each other. And if they're not together. It's just that constant, like, wow, how can you? I understand it's a money thing uh, with most bands, and it's also a personality thing and stuff like that. But it is uh, rock and roll is is a, a rough thing to do. I get it. It is hard to have band members, and especially if you got two brothers that fight with each other. And then you have other guys that take sides with uh, either brother and it becomes this fucking poisonous thing. But it is wild. And, and that's why I always promote all these bands that I, I love right now instead of complaining about who's in the Black Crows. I've said it over and over. But it is uh, unbelievable to see the level of playing that Mark Ford is doing on his Instagram and then it got me thinking about the Black Crows, and I didn't even realize, without an announcement, they have two new players again. A new guitar player and a new drummer. Without even, you know, they had the guy from Earthless, and they had a, a different drummer for the, uh, you know, when I saw him at the Troubadour a couple years back when they announced the Shaker Moneymaker uh, anniversary tour. And then just without of nowhere, there's two new guys. And uh, let's see here. It is uh, Cooley, Cooley Simington, um, who played with Afghan Wigs for a little bit. Uh, he's played with Connor. Uh, it's John Doe. He's played with, uh, who else has he played with? Uh, let's see here. Oh, Sparta. He was in Sparta. He's Nashville, but I think he lives in uh hey, he lives in Nashville. Okay. Anyway, so new drummer out of nowhere, and then a new guitar player out of nowhere. Nico, this guy's from Brazil, I believe. Nico Beraciatu. I don't know how to say his last name, but I think he played in Rich's solo band, if I'm not mistaken. 
plays a, a kick-ass looking three pickup less uh less Paul SG. Just two new players out of fucking nowhere. Where's the other guys? It doesn't matter anymore. The other guys do not matter in the Black Crows at all. It's the brothers and whoever, nobody, uh, nobody even seemed to mention it in any of the, you know, they played two shows with Aerosmith, but then uh, Tyler's voice is uh, uh, blown out right now. So they're taking six dates off, but not one fucking mention of like, I'm watching the video and I go, who are these guys? And then I went to the Black Crow's current page on Wikipedia to see, yep, there's the two new guys are playing. And then Sven's still on base. Um, but then I start looking at former players. It is incredible. The list of former players is fucking nuts. Of course, the great, great, legendary Steve Gorman. Uh, to not have him in the band, just unbelievable. And then Johnny Colt. We know he, you know, he played for uh, uh, the the Golden Years. Mark Ford, Eddie Hirsch, rest in peace. Eddie Harsh, sorry, Eddie Hirsch. Eddie Harsh, uh, one of the greatest B3 players I've ever seen. They had Audley Free for a while. Uh, Andy Hess played uh, bass for a while. They had a, some guy, uh, Bill DeBro. That was the guy that I saw in New York who opened the first Black Crows reunion and they fired him immediately after the New York run and got, uh, he was, he was not good in the Black Crows. They got Gorman back by the Atlanta gigs. Rob Chorus, keyboards 0607. No idea who that is. Paul Stacy, he, He's a fucking, he did those incredible uh, Chris Robinson solo records uh new earth mud that guy's fucking great and great producer i love chris robinson's new earth mud more than crb all day long adam mcdougall who uh you know was on keys for a while luther the slide the great slide player was there for a while jackie green which was bizarre friend of mine great singer songwriter he played guitar tim uh, Lefebvre, I fuck up everyone's names, touring only from 2019 to 20. I don't even know Tim, but he must have been in there in between Sven. Raj Ola on drums, no idea. Isaiah Mitchell, that was uh, the guy from um, uh, Earthless or uh, Earthlings. Um, Joel Robinow keyboards. 2019-22, Brian Griffin, drums, touring session drummer, 21-23. That was that drummer that I saw. So tons of members. And uh, sorry, I fucked up a lot of your names. I suck at names. And uh, but, you know, it is uh, it is wild to think about. There's just two new dudes in the Black Crows. It doesn't even fucking make the news anymore. Because now I think it's just kind of people just go like, oh, yeah, the brothers, yeah, fired another guy or whatever. It's just wild. But um, like I said, I don't sit there and go, you know, oh, they should have these guys in. If I, if I, you know, I just go see new, new bands. I just go see Marcus King. That's my Black Crows of 2023. You know, I go see Neil Francis. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a hard game with personalities and thank God I do comedy because I've been there in my lifetime of, uh, switching band members and, and, and a lot of times it wasn't about firing band members. It's just couldn't afford band members. Uh, they had to go, uh, make a living playing in some other bands, which I fucking get it. And then you're constantly thinking about, God, I wish I. I wish fucking Ronnie Crawford was on this gig playing drums. But anyway, Black Crows, two new members. Really wild. Uh, I want to uh, I want to close the show out with uh, a little conversation. I was uh, backstage at the comedy store. And uh, I got a Miles Davis hoodie. Uh, from a friend of mine recently. And I just love the Miles Davis uh, hoodie and 
I was talking to uh, Tom Papa backstage, fantastic comedian. And he's all, Miles Davis, cool hoodie. I go, yeah, I've just been listening to a shitload of Miles Davis in the last six months. Just really, uh, it, it's funny to think about as you get older. I always loved Miles Davis certain eras i was way into the live at the fillmore the weird abstract miles davis and it would come and go in my life miles davis or curtis mayfield uh curtis is not the same but i'm just saying you get into these these obsessions to where you're like well i just listen to curtis mayfield now and i just chill you know and and at 57 years old and uh, trying to relieve a, a, a lot of uh, clutter in my mind with uh, this past year just being fucking just brutal and good. It's like massive ups, massive downs. I, I, I dove deep into Miles Davis again. And I think he's just going to be there for the rest of my life now. I'm at the Miles Davis era of my life. That's how old I am. How old are you? I'm Miles Davis uh, daily years old. That's how old I am. And it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's funny. It's not for everybody. And I used to do this bit where I go, jazz fans are dicks. You ever meet one at a party? They're like, what kind of music do you like? Oh, I like metal <sighs> music for peasants. I like jazz. And then I would say something like, yeah, well, I got friends. Yeah. <laughs> it was some kind of early Delray joke that I loved, you know, because that would be a jazz fan. You, you know, jazz fans are kind of, uh, they're a different type of person, you know. They um, are just a, they're the person, I'm talking about a person that only listens to jazz where they look down upon any other music, which speaking about that, what about that fucker from uh, Rolling Stone magazine, man? Speaking of looking down on music, who would have thought that this fucking guy would just turn out to just be a fucking fool moron? Like just insane comments against uh, like Joni Mitchell, and Janis Joplin and Grace, Grace Slick and uh, and blues artists and stuff. What? What the fuck, man? I can't even believe that came out of a guy who started Rolling Stone, a counterculture magazine that celebrated, you know, multicultural uh, love and uh, battles against uh, Vietnam War and a celebration of the hippie era of uh, Hendrix and Santana, uh, the, the, a Hispanic man and a black man and, and, and hippies who were considered complete, you know, dirt people. I mean, I can't even fucking believe what, what, what this guy said. It's unreal. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so the jazz fan, you know, those type of people that just kind of look down on all music but jazz. And I mean, I get it. If you're if you're just a full on one thing, I, I meet people all the time out there. People that are only heavy metal. There's people that are only hip hop. There's people that are only country. I never understood it. And uh, it's just like I've said years and years on the show, I don't only go see comedy movies. I don't only eat burritos, you know, like who doesn't want tons of variety in your life? It's so fucking boring if you don't. It's crazy. Anyway, Miles Davis, it's not something that you just it's like the dead. Where you're like, where do I start? Miles Davis just has like a hundred fucking records on Amazon Music. It is crazy. 
And I always loved Miles Davis on and off because I just thought, you know, when I started to get into kind of Almond Brothers and jamming, I was always fascinated by Miles and the people that played with him and and the jams that he did. He was he was just a, he is king jam. This guy is so abstract and wild and so much fucking mood and 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 heart and flavor coming out of this guy. It's wild, man. I, he died in 91. I never saw Miles Davis. It's weird to think about how you could have saw Miles Davis in the 80s. No problem. You know, Miles Davis to me just seems like such an old soul. He seems like something that was straight up 60s. And you, you don't even think about like Miles Davis is out touring in the 70s and 80s just playing. And, uh, you know, I remember diving deep into Miles Davis back in the day. He was a huge Ferrari fan. He loved Ferraris. I was like, that's fucking cool. He's talked about how he would just get in his Ferrari and drive up around in upstate Connecticut or something and just free his mind and hear the engine. And uh, I loved the fact that he owned a couple Ferraris and he just, he'd tour and then come home and drive these Ferraris. And uh, I love those great Jim Marshall photos of him in the boxing ring. Just, and his look, those fucking glasses he'd wear. But to get into Miles Davis music, it's just like, where do you even start? So I would say there's, it just depends what you want to hear out of Miles. And I'm going to give you some surface beginner Miles. Now for me, if you have Sirius XM, Miles Davis has a station. Uh, he doesn't. He's, you know, he's not no longer with us. But there's a Miles Davis station. And it's pretty incredible. You just put that on and uh, let it fly and see if it grabs you. I don't think there's no way not something's not going to grab you out of Miles Davis. You know, you're just listening to it like, Oh, this is fucking cool. What is this? So for a long time, I was Miles Davis live at the Fillmore. And that is a really hard listen because it's really abstract. The horn playing is crazy. It's like, it's crazy, fucking crazy jazz. But I think for maybe a beginner, you want to get in. Here's some uh, of my list. Of course, Kind of Blue is totally famous, and that's kind of an era of Miles that is straight up jazz, you know. Bitches Brew, another era that is, uh, you know, classic Miles. But for me, if you want to get into it, check out On the Corner. There's two versions. There's On the Corners, Super Complete Deluxe, which I just throw on and let it fucking fly. And then there's Regular On the Corner. Artwork is fantastic on the cover. Just unbelievable. But this record for me, all day fucking long, every day, um, really, really has seemed to have... Uh, been a, an easer on my mind and it also kind of helps you think outside the box I, I play a lot of miles davis then i i want to write some bits i can kind of uh you know it opens up my mind to think a little different way but give yourself a fucking uh a little dose of uh pleasantness <laughs> a little dose of pleasantness with some Miles Davis, man. Go give it a check out. In person, Friday night at the Blackhawk. I love the name of that record. That's a, a club in San Fran back in the day, the Blackhawk. And the record, in person, Friday night at the Blackhawk. <laughs> That'd be a great, uh, a great like comedy special. In person, Saturday night, second show, Comedy Store, Dean Del Rey. Anyway, uh, speaking of that, I'm going to be in Utah this weekend at Boxcar Comedy. Please uh, buy some tickets and come out. If you know anybody in Utah, 
let them know I'm going to be there. It's only two shows. It's one Friday, one Saturday. And uh, this club is brand new and they're really fucking cool people. So do yourself a favor, get a ticket on my website, deandelray.com. And uh, if you want to join the Patreon, that's patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. And there's merch on my website also, by the way. And um, I hope to see you at the um, the Boxcar Comedy and then the Funny Pages in Colorado Springs. That's coming up. And then a lot of shows with Bill Burr, of course, the Madison Square Garden, which is on November, I think that's the 10th. Yeah, let me look real quick. And uh, the garden, there might be a few tickets left on that. I'm just, uh, fuck, man. Yeah, the 10th is the garden. And a lot of other shows, man. It's uh, it's coming out. The uh, year is, is winding down with a lot of great shows. I hope to see you guys out there. Can't thank you enough for your support. And uh, I appreciate it. Like I said, there's some very, very cool guests coming up on Let There Be Talk. And I'm just not going to tell you who they are right now, just because uh, whenever I do that, I seem to jinx myself. So no longer am I doing that. But in the meantime, like I said, I really appreciate you guys uh, enjoying the solo episodes. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a review on iTunes. It really helps, believe it or not. Some kind of bullshit where if you review and like something it puts it up on the charts higher we're at uh, number 60 this week on itunes pretty fucking good all right the candles are lit my friends have a great week and see you on patreon tonight patreon is for the zoom around 6 p.m pacific time see ya